Hey everyone, this video will be a wild ride. It's long but packed with content. It's broken up into chapters so you can choose what parts you want to watch, but I genuinely believe the video is worth watching in its entirety. My primary goal is to communicate some important information to those of you considering buying this device, but there's also one hell of a story to be told, which I think is very important and explains exactly why I made this video. I asked advice, mulled it over, considered the pros and cons, and tried to just forget about it, but I couldn't. This video was a major commitment, as I'm already stretched thin working on projects like the ones you're seeing in this intro, but I feel compelled to make this video to shine some light on a situation that thrives in darkness. The original version featured footage from the inventor's YouTube channel in what could only be described as textbook fair use, but the video got a copyright strike. Instead of fighting it, I decided to re-record his lines word for word, then used a voice changer to clearly indicate his original quotes. I also replaced all of his footage with this, which will make sense by the end of the video. My original plan was to reenact his videos as well, but due to how important I think this is, I wanted to ensure there was no possibility of it getting taken down. With all of that said, I hope you all enjoy the video and get some value out of it. A few weeks ago, I was looking for something to watch on YouTube after work, and came across this video, Fret Leveling One Fret at a Time with Fret Maestro. Looked interesting, so I clicked to see what it was about. Right here we're looking at the third fret. We said we should add the line. Within the first 30 seconds, I got the feeling that the intention was to sell something, which isn't a bad thing at all. I sell things too. But the premise being set up felt a bit off to me. Moments like this. When, you know, you're doing freehand work with flat tools, straight tools, hand files that have no control other than guesswork, okay? Saying that all we have is guesswork is quite hyperbolic. With an appropriate degree of skill, the accuracy of fretwork can be very high, within a ten thousandth, if not a one hundred thousandth of an inch. This margin of error is completely imperceptible, and any luthier or repair person worth their salt can easily work within those margins. As the video goes on, one major issue becomes apparent to me, which I'll explain in detail in a moment. But this issue means that it's physically impossible for this device to do many of the things the presenter is claiming. And these claims become more and more excessive as the video continues until we end up here. I can do the same thing with every fret, that fast and that easy. They will all be at exactly the same height, the same ray as the same crown. They will be symmetrical clones of each other. And by having that, you're going to get the best possibility ever of optimizing the guitar setup for your playability and your intonation. This is where I really raised an eyebrow. Let me explain why, and we'll take a break from this narrative to go over some things. Nowhere in this video was there any consideration for the coplanarity of the frets, which is the single most important factor in the quality of a setup. So what is coplanarity? Put simply, it's the quality of two or more objects being level to one another in every direction. For example, these two cylinders are not coplanar, nor are they here, nor here. For them to be coplanar, the extensions of their surfaces relative to one another must coincide. Just like the surface of these cylinders, the peak or crown of each fret must be on the same plane from the first to the last fret. Frets require this along the entire length of the fretboard for a guitar to have the best possible setup. If you're not very experienced with guitar work, your first inclination might be to think, well, the fretboard is acting as a guide, which keeps all of the crowns aligned. And that is the principle that this tool is built on. It uses the fretboard on each side of the fret as a reference surface that it rides along, making sure the crown is always at the exact same height relative to the fretboard. The problem is, wood is a fickle thing, especially when subjected to 150 pounds of string tension 24-7. Humidity, temperature, barometric pressure, and even how a guitar is sat all have an impact on the wood and how it moves over time. There are millions of micro variables in every square inch of wood, which all stack up over time irregularly and unpredictably to create bows, twists, humps, divots, and other inconsistencies across the entire neck. 
Here are three real-life examples I chose completely at random. All three necks are as straight as they can possibly be, having the truss rods adjusted to show the least amount of light between the fretboard and the notch straight edge. This straight edge is regularly checked against a granite block to confirm that it's perfectly straight. And you can see that all three necks have a different range of inconsistencies. This happens to all guitars in completely different ways. For example, Fender guitars and other bolt-on neck guitars almost always develop what I call a ramp that starts around the 13th to 15th fret due to the upper frets being fully supported by the neck pocket while the rest of the neck isn't. Over time, the unsupported section of the neck bows forward, but the heel section doesn't, and what you end up with is a permanent ramp on the upper frets, which causes buzzing and fretting out with low action. The only way to address this is to use a leveling beam that overlaps all of the frets at once. You can see that this takes much more material off of the upper frets than it does the relatively unaffected lower frets. And by doing this, it makes the crowns of the frets coplanar, even though the fretboard itself isn't. Then, recrowning the frets accurately is trivial for any experienced luthier or repair person. In all of the examples I've shown, if we use Fret Maestro, we would be translating these problems directly back into the crowns, solving nothing. This actually can and will do measurable damage to a guitar that's previously had its frets leveled to address these issues. There were several comments pointing this flaw out, and the response they got was along the lines of, Fretboards have all the nadeless CNC machines since 1987, so they're perfectly straight. But even the most well-machined fretboard will lose perfect coplanarity by the end of the very day it was machined, and to an increasingly large degree over time due to the variables I mentioned. Even brand new professional grade guitars will have enough inconsistencies to impact playability and benefit from fret leveling. It takes very little. Even the slightest bit can require higher than necessary action to avoid buzzing. A traditional sanding beam addresses this easily and with perfect results allowing much lower action without any fretting out. In fact, it's the only way to achieve this by hand. Again, the frets have to be coplanar to achieve the best possible setup. Later in the video, the presenter even alludes to this by saying, You're looking for the lowest fret, because the lowest fret, you can't have any frets. I mean, all your frets have to be the same height. But at the same height compared to what? To each other, yes but this device does not and cannot do that. Another claim made in the video is this. It's, it's very difficult to make a radius with a straight file. This is outright false. It's trivial for an experienced luthier or repair person to maintain a functionally perfect radius. The actual radius itself doesn't need to be exact as long as it's within roughly 5% tolerance of the intended radius. What matters, again, is that all of the frets are coplanar. A slight deviation from the side-to-side -side radius is imperceptible and has zero impact on playability so long as it's consistent from the first to last fret, or again, coplanar. But a slight deviation from coplanarity will have a significant impact. This is precisely why we use sanding beams. His contention about using a flat tool against a radius sounds reasonable when asserting that this is super challenging. But in reality, anybody with an acceptable skill level can easily maintain a consistent crown. This is a trivial issue when you know how to use your senses and have experience. The primary indicator is the width of the flat on top of the crown as you're recrowning. Any luthier worth seeing will have the ability to control the crown within a ten thousandth of an inch just by watching the flat. You can get it razor thin all the way across the length of the fret very easily if you have the right tool, any awareness, and the necessary experience, then your polishing stage has so little to take up that there's zero functional difference. Another major issue with the flat tools versus radius frets argument is that many modern guitars have compound radii. For these, you would need a set of 24 radius files for each scale length multiplied by each compounding ratio. To be as accurate as a traditional beam and file method, you'd need hundreds if not thousands of radius inserts and would have to change each one between every single fret after measuring them individually or coming up with a formula to calculate. But with one file and 30 minutes, we can do any guitar on earth. Another thing you can do with a beam, which you can't do with this tool, is add a slight compound to older guitars with seven and a quarter or nine and a half radii. 
so that they can be set up with lower action and won't fret out when bending. This is a common job I do for my clients and they're always very happy with the results. You can't do these things with a predetermined radius. So with all of that out of the way, let's get back into the narrative. Once I finished this video, I looked through the comments and saw several of them pointing out these issues, which he responded to with his CNC claims, and I responded to them letting them know that they were in fact correct. Then I left a comment of my own where I was very sympathetic, expressing admiration for his engineering, but explained the same issues I've gone over and suggested that he simply alter the marketing to reflect what this tool can and cannot do. I stated that he has a responsibility to recognize, consider, and communicate with potential buyers the limitations of this device, as he's setting expectations too high, and some people will hurt their instruments due to these expectations. I closed the page and moved on, hoping I'd get a response, but just happy that I could leave my thoughts for potential buyers to consider. It didn't cross my mind again for several days until I saw this video pop up in my feed. If you go look at the video now, the title is somewhat different than the title it had when I saw it, which included the phrase, Dispelling the Naysayers. Well, that's me, but this was posted days before my comment. There must be a lot of people leaving similar comments. I wonder what he has to say about all of this. Lunch tea with six fingers? Founder, six stringers? Ah, uh, you may have seen some of our videos on YouTube. Okay, this video was infuriating to watch. In my opinion, it's nothing but false claims, intentional misrepresentation of criticism, and some very sly misdirection. This section could be a whole video on its own, but let's just keep it all in one place. The video opens with an overview of the criticism where he states, The single most objection is that the neck fretboard are asymmetrical, not symmetrical. And so that you're really supposed to be just doing the tops of the threats, like with the sanding ring, because it doesn't get affected by the fretboard. So I'm here to address that fact by fact by fact. The concern has nothing to do with symmetry, so this is an odd thing to bring up. But yes, doing the tops of the frets only, due to inconsistencies of the neck, is a valid and very important factor as I've described and demonstrated earlier in this video. Next we have this. Do the makers make their fretboards and their necks asymmetrical? No, they don't. This is where it starts to become difficult to maintain a neutral tone about this. This is such a disingenuous thing to say, and I have trouble believing he's unaware of this fact. Not only is it trivial to make a near-perfect radius, even by hand, but obviously, manufacturers are not making their fretboards asymmetrically. Again, asymmetry has nothing to do with any of the concerns people have expressed. He continues. What would make a neck asymmetrical? What would make a neck asymmetrical is that you're in an arid climate and you don't humidify your guitar, the wood drives out, it begins to split, it's pushing up frets, or should I say the frets are lifting out. Notice how he quickly corrects himself after stating the fact that the wood starts lifting frets and changes it to the frets start lifting out. It's pushing up frets, or should I say the frets are lifting out so as to not confront the fact that yes, the wood around the fret is causing the problem. Because if the wood itself is raising the fret, wouldn't Fret Maestro be putting that problem right back into the fret since it rides along that very wood? He appears to know that this is a problem and slyly corrects this slip up. The other cause would be high viewbity. So the wood ab absorbs moisture like a sponge, it expands, and now it's pushing the frets up out of the wood and deforming the wood. And then you say, oh, well, I'll have to do to dry it. And when you dry it, you notice that the texture of the wood, the grain, is really rough. And at the same time, even though you may not see it, the fretboard begins to emanate from the neck. While, yes, some of the conditions he describes absolutely contribute to issues with the wood of the neck and fretboard, he greatly exaggerates how bad these conditions have to be to have an effect. I've been building and repairing guitars for 15 years. I've built or worked on likely thousands of guitars, and I've done all kinds of other woodworking, all of which have taught me a lot about wood. 
I can say with absolute certainty, as can any professional woodworker, that even small changes in temperature and humidity can have a noticeable impact on wood. Even a 10% change in humidity will cause wood to swell or shrink. It does not take extreme conditions to do this, and over time, these stresses cause permanent deformation, no matter how small. These things start happening the day the wood is cut, and will continue until the day the wood is rendered back into the earth from rot. This is the very nature of wood. After this, he makes one of the most egregious claims thus far. That's not a fixable guitar unless you replace the fretboard and or the neck both. Okay. So, there's that. Not only is this egregious, but it's outright unethical if he is giving this advice to players and actually charging them money to have this extremely costly job done when it's absolutely unnecessary. I've worked on thousands of guitars, and there isn't a single guitar I've ever had to replace a fretboard on simply because of a warped fretboard. Replacing a board is an extreme and exceptionally rare thing to need done. My assumption is that he's trying to overstate these issues in the most hyperbolic way possible so that he can frame it as, if your fretboard isn't straight anymore, then it's beyond repair and nothing will help you anyway besides getting a new fretboard, in an attempt to dodge this issue and present it as outside of the capabilities of even traditional methods. But this is absolutely false. As I've shown in my demonstrations, even significantly warped boards can be easily fixed by leveling frets. In extreme cases, we pull the frets, work the board back to coplanarity, and refret. He also mentions delamination as if this is a common thing and states that sometimes you can't tell if it's delaminating. This is only true in extreme cases, and I mean extreme cases. The conditions have to be horrendous for extended periods of time for this to be an issue. These things have nothing to do with typical guitar maintenance where fret leveling is needed and only act as red herrings to distract away from the actual concerns that have been expressed. None of this is applicable to the relevant discussion here. It's entirely misdirecting, and it strongly appears to be by intention. Next, we have this. White House of Guitars were had fingerware on the fretwork, so you had little divots in the fretwork from the fingerware over time, and you're talking 10, 12 years, and so the naysayers are going to say, well, that's, that's going to make it so that fret monistro you know, isn't going to work. Well, except what they're not realizing is that Fret Michael bridges that. Okay? (laughs) This appears to be yet another misdirect. I don't believe anybody has made this criticism, and it felt to me watching this that he is simply setting up a bunch of non-issues so he can argue against those things which he has a valid defense against, while completely ignoring the actual criticism. He goes on to give a demonstration in Photoshop where he starts with this. The detractors, the naysayers, the doubters, they're saying, oh, you know, fretboards are not flat, they're uneven, they're this or that. Okay, that's not actually true. Yes, it is true. This is a random guitar I grabbed, and you can clearly see that the fretboard is not even or level. There is no string tension on the neck, and I've adjusted the truss rod to make it as straight as possible. But there are still inconsistencies. Here's another guitar. You can clearly see light coming through under the straight edge where there are low spots. And here is another random guitar, and you can still see that there are inconsistencies. I don't know how I could make this any more clear. This is a simple fact about guitar necks, and anybody who's done legitimate guitar work knows this. This should not even be a discussion, so we should be asking, why is it being brought up? He continues. Okay, that's not actually true, but let's say for purposes of giving a little credit that that's, that is so. And they say that a fret micro can't work because, you know, the fretboard's uneven. Well, with a 10,000th bow, obviously, that's very little. And this is the fret maestro right here. This is the fret. This is the file. And we see that it's flush. And we don't see any distortion there. None of this is relevant to the concerns. And the only reason I can see for adding it is, again, to misdirect the viewers into thinking that this is what people were saying when it's not. Yes, his tool will ride evenly relative to each individual fret, but we cannot treat frets as discrete units. As I've demonstrated, what's important is the coplanarity of all of the frets together, and this tool literally cannot achieve this. I can't stress this enough. It is physically impossible 
for this device to accomplish this. Let's show what Fret Maestro does on a typical Strat neck. As we can see, this fretboard has a ramp. Since Fret Maestro uses the fretboard as its reference surface, using it to file the frets keeps that ramp intact. As you can see, this tool simply reintroduces the very problem it's claiming to address. This sort of ramp or warpage is extremely common. 80 to 90% of bolt on neck guitars have this issue to some degree, so this isn't some extreme case I'm using to make my point. This is the average fret job to improve the playability of a guitar. Even in set necks or neck through instruments, there will be some inconsistencies that impact the coplanarity. I just use the strat neck as my primary example because the geometry of it really helps get the idea across. In the next section of this video, we see this. This green monster up here, most people are familiar with, is called a sanding beam. So, we'll get that sanding beam and see what happens with that. Bring it down to the bow. And what we see is this really huge gap. So obviously you must flatten the neck perfectly. It's getting more and more difficult to maintain a neutral demeanor. This demonstration is so backwards that I actually did the Captain Picard the first time seeing it. Why he's comparing the sanding beam to the surface of the fretboard in this example is beyond me. This is completely backwards and appears to be another intentional misdirect. As I've shown, the entire purpose of a sanding beam is that it ignores the inconsistencies of the fretboard. It does not matter if the fretboard is warped. What matters is that the frets are coplanar. The only time a sanding beam has any relevance to the fretboard surface is when you're resurfacing it after pulling frets to address extreme warping that's beyond the ability of fretwork to address. But in that case, what he's showing is precisely the reason it's effective. The beam being flat is what fixes the problem. Is he implying that you would want a beam that follows the warpage of the neck? Because that's the conclusion you'd have to come to if what he's illustrating is some sort of problem. This whole section is just bizarre. He goes on to confront yet another non-issue with how Fret Maestro follows the radius. And so when they say there's the detractors and the doubters, they say, well, because of that, Fret Maestro can't work. Uh, well... <laughs> Yes, he can. And so I'm going to show you what Fret Maestro does is it bridges over these problems. It doesn't even register those problems because it bridges over them. Like the rest of the video, this point has nothing to do with the actual problem. Yes, Fret Maestro will bridge the inconsistencies. So what? What does this have to do with the frets being level? Nothing. It's just another valid argument he can make against a concern that nobody expressed. Just like he does here. Uh, just to come back on this a little bit, you know, because I know how naysayers are. They're really stubborn. They can say, well, the fret maestro was nice and even across the neck before, but at an angle it is going to not do things the right way. Nobody said this. This isn't the problem. So we're seeing a pattern here. Nowhere in the 16-minute video did he address the one major concern that's been expressed. Instead, he distracts the viewer with red herrings demonstrating the invalidity of complaints that nobody made to then act as if he dispelled the naysayers when he, in fact, did not. There's one glaring major issue with his claims that has been brought up dozens of times and he's somehow neglected to mention that and only showed irrelevant demonstrations that address nothing. And all of this is after making several highly dubious claims about guitars, some of which are outright unethical. I know I'm getting animated, but I want to remind you, this man went through a whole invention process where he conceptualized this device, designed and engineered it in CAD, likely went through a prototyping stage where he made a series of changes to perfect it, funded and directed a manufacturing process, and is now directing a well-produced marketing campaign. This is not an oblivious, unintelligent, or witless man. Based on all of this evidence, I strongly believe that he knows exactly what he's doing. And the following segment should really help solidify this. So let's get back to my narrative. After this video, I was quite irritated for the reasons I just went over. I typed out a long comment going over all of the criticisms I just outlined and more. 
My tone this time was less sympathetic and more suspicious, but still not overly aggressive or insulting. Something didn't feel right, though, and I wanted to say something about it. After I typed out my comment, I took a moment to think about whether I should post it or not. I genuinely always try to give people the benefit of doubt, and this is no exception. I thought about how this guy invented a tool that he believes in and is proud of. It's a well-engineered tool, after all. It just has some issues. In my comment on his other video, I mentioned changing his marketing to reflect its limitations as to not create unreasonable expectations. I thought about how maybe he'd consider that, or at least respond so we could have a productive dialogue. If that happened, I'd get a better idea of what kind of person he is before I made a judgment. He responded to several criticisms before, after all. So I saved my comment and moved on for a few days. After that few days was up, I decided to check my notifications. Nothing yet, but sometimes YouTube is finicky and doesn't notify me. I'll open up the video just to check. What do you know? My comment was gone. Not only was my comment gone, but so were all of the comments I responded to in defense of their points, along with every other comment that was critical. Not just on this video, but every other video. No longer was I uncertain of his intentions. Now I knew my gut feeling was correct. This man is deliberately trying to avoid and silence criticism. And to me, this strongly indicates intentional deception. I hold as an axiom that those who hide from scrutiny do so because they know their position is indefensible. A factual and valid position seeks out debate as it can easily endure it. The truth never hides. With this in mind, I made some alterations to the comment I was waiting to post, and I posted it. This time, I proceeded with zero sympathy or benefit of doubt. I started this all with more kindness and sympathy than he was owed, and would have forgotten about it had he responded constructively or even just simply left my original comment up as a source of information for potential buyers. Instead, he engaged the Streisand effect, which all of us internet dwellers are well aware of. Several days went by as I checked if my comment was still present, which it was. Then one day I noticed that he changed the title and removed the Dispelling the Naysayers part. This appears to be a way to not attract critics like me who would see that and watch it out of curiosity. Yet another action that appears to be deliberately aimed at avoiding scrutiny. So I tried to edit my comment to reflect that some parts of it were in reference to the original title. But when I went to post the edit, I got an error. I tried again, and still got the same error. How suspicious. I realized something fishy was going on. And after watching the view count go up over the course of a week and seeing several new comments but getting no likes or responses to my comment, and seeing no new critical comments like I did before, I knew something was going on. I signed into my second account to view the comments, and what do you know? My comment is nowhere to be found either hidden or reported so as to only appear to me, tricking me into believing that it was still posted. I hope this is illustrating how strong of a pattern of deeply questionable behavior is coming from this man. Throughout this entire journey, he has not provided a single valid response or allowed a single critical comment. Instead, it appears he's done nothing but deliberately hide criticism, completely ignore the one major concern people have continuously brought up, and misrepresent that criticism as something entirely different several times. This product, while well-engineered, is very limited in its capabilities, but it does have some potential use cases. For example, it could theoretically be used to address a couple high frets at home with some careful measurement and planning. It's also a semi-effective way to recrown worn-out frets, although it won't leave the best surface finish, and the depth stop feature would need bypass for this. In both of these cases, though, traditional tools would be just as easy and effective and would cost far less. And in both cases, compound radius fretboards would actually be damaged by this tool. While mentioning compound radii, technically called a conical radius, I should also mention that this was also brought up by others, which he responded to before deleting. Trying to interpolate a conical radius into a set of 4 or even 10 or even 100 predetermined radii will cause all kinds of significant issues with abrupt changes between spans of frets. Where you switch to a flatter radius, the previous fret would be far too low on the edges, causing buzz, or more likely, completely dead nose from fretting out. This isn't a possibility, this is a mathematical fact. Look at this illustration. 
You can see that the apex, or central peak of each fret, is coplanar, but at the edges they are not. This is true for both sides. As you can see, this abrupt change in radius creates a near-total lack of coplanarity, where the edges are significantly lower than the centers. This can and will cause buzzing at every transition. You might be able to work around this issue by raising your action, but that entirely defeats the purpose of doing fretwork and proves, irrefutably, that Fret Maestro is inferior to even a basic $20 sanding beam. I want to wrap this up with a response to this quote. Fret Maestro is the best hand tool ever made for leveling, radiating, and crowning your frets. You cannot do it with a sanding beam. You cannot make the radius with a straight file and how to be symmetrical for 22 frets. This is an outright arrogant and inaccurate thing to say. I couldn't help but to scoff the first time I heard it. He is either so deeply misinformed that he actually believes this, which immediately puts his product into question, or he knows it's nonsense and is deliberately lying to just sell a product. It's physically impossible for this product to level your frets, so it is literally the worst tool for that. Getting a highly accurate radius with a beam is trivial, as I've stated before. The radiusing ability of this device has almost zero benefit. While a beam may not provide a microscopically perfect radius, that is not only completely imperceptible, but is completely irrelevant, as having the crown's coplanar is infinitely more important than having the perfect radius. I want you to consider that the breakdown in cost for this device is about $150 for one single radius. Meanwhile, the exceptionally good Stumac Z file is under $100 and can do an infinite range of radii. You'd have to spend $1,700 to have a mere 11 radius inserts. Doing the math, it would cost tens of thousands of dollars to even approach what a single flat crowning file could do. I have to reiterate, this device will make many guitars worse. If the frets were previously leveled to address coplanarity issues, this will reintroduce those issues and significantly hurt playability. This happening isn't just a possibility, it's an absolute certainty. So these are things that he has a responsibility to recognize, consider, and communicate with potential buyers, but instead he's dug his heels in and started a censorship campaign against any critics who point these things out. But here I am. And as I said, I will not be silenced. The final thing I want to say is that this video is not intended to ruin anybody or send hate their way, so please don't use it as a springboard for cruelty. I may be aggressively critical in some places, but my intention is for this video to stand as a strong counterfactual to all of the outrageous claims made about this device so that potential buyers are more informed and as a way to illustrate the behavior associated with these claims which I believe shows malicious intent. I'm not trying to sell anything, and my intention isn't motivated by wanting to reduce DIY guitar work. I never discourage people from doing as much as they can at home. In fact, I give my clients instruction and even demonstrate to them how to do things so they don't have to rely on me for everything. I don't upcharge for parts, my prices are competitive, and I've made several videos with the sole intent of helping DIYers and budding luthiers make their own tools at home. All of this is to say, my criticism isn't motivated by wanting to get more work by saying, only we can work on guitars. I simply value the truth and feel a moral obligation to speak up about a problem I have the unique qualifications and skills to successfully address. So please, if you're considering purchasing this tool, I ask that you at least take this video into consideration before doing so. This is where the video was going to end. But if everything so far wasn't enough to convince you, there's another big revelation that I discovered right as I was wrapping up editing this. I was doing some final research and came across this forum post. Some comments were critical, some comments were neutral, but I saw this and it immediately caught my attention. So I opened the video to see what this guy Chris has to say. So let's talk about Fret Maestro for a minute. As I'm wont to do, the first thing I did was read the comments before watching and what a trip they were. Not only is there a condescending comment from the owner of Fret Maestro, but there was another highly suspicious comment thread sharing a now private rebuttal video. But the responses from the original poster of this comment were strange, to say the least. Oddly defensive, but in a way that came off suspiciously as an act. As the thread progressed, I could see that several comments were deleted. Very suspicious. 
My first thought was that this was the owner using a fake account. Everything up until this point really makes that a sensible conclusion. I scrolled back up and started Chris's video. And wow, what a revealing story this is. He starts off with a brief explanation of why he decided to purchase Fret Maestro and humbly states that he's not a technician, just a player who thought it might help him do some DIY work. Pretty reasonable, and I can tell this guy is genuine, level-headed, and well-spoken. A minute and 20 seconds in, he explains that the order was never fulfilled and that he asked for a refund. And then I waited. And on reverb, it stated that it'd be shipped in two to three days. No, it wasn't. And so I messaged Reverb that I wanted to cancel my order. I messaged the, the seller actually first that I wanted to cancel my order and I was asking for a refund. I'd say that's a pretty reasonable request. Then he reads his first interaction during the refund process. And this is what I sent him first. All right, so you guys can follow along with this. It says I ordered on Tuesday. It's Friday and still only a label created. I have no faith that the product will be shipped this month, so I would like to cancel the order. Not harsh. I don't, I don't think so. And this is what he was replying, and I get it. I get it. We got slammed. Your order is next in line. We did not expect to get hit like this. 18-hour days to try and get them all out. For sure, your order will go out no later than Monday, hopefully today. Really have not had time to contact everyone, as I very much would like to. Please don't be mad. Now, remember that please don't be mad part. My reply, between 10.29 this morning, I would like to cancel the order, and I've already requested a refund. So right now, there's no confrontations whatsoever. You know, he made an excuse. What I thought was an excuse, in my opinion, was an excuse. And I get it. I'm still not upset. It's not a big deal. I just want to cancel the order. I like this guy. I think anybody watching this can tell he's no troll or hater, nor is he remotely unreasonable. He seems like an honest, intelligent, and understanding person who simply has firm expectations. And that's a good trait I think we can all admire. As the video goes on, the responses from the owner become more and more aggressive and antagonistic until they become borderline blackmail. I won't play the entire video here, and I highly recommend that you go watch it from beginning to end because it's a great video and is incredibly enlightening. But here's some of the highlights. This is his response. Well, so now, please note, we are totally slammed with orders. Right now, we are looking at seven days before we can ship. Now, it went from two to three days, now seven days. Never said that on the reverb comment section when you read all that stuff about their shipping. Working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, but be in the, listen, be in the know. We will not refund impatient buyers. This is what got it started. Other than that don't be mad part, remember that part. This is his from good people customers. So in other words, he was calling me a bad person customer, all right? No, this is what one guy said. No problem. I'd, ha I'd rather have it right than fast. Do what you got to do. And the other person said, no problem. My wife is a small business owner, and I understand. Thanks for the message. Looking forward to trying out the Fret Maestro. But here's my response. Other customers' opinion do not dictate mine. Now, on the reverb page, it says two to three days to ship. You have gone beyond that which you have stated. I'm looking for your statement about no refunds for impatient buyers, no exceptions. I'm looking for made to order, and you can make all the excuses you want, but I will not accept the package regardless of when it's shipped. Now, I'm a little upset this time. All right, here's his response to that You're a jerk. My response, yeah, you're a terrible business owner. I'd rather be a jerk. So now it's getting a little dicey, right? And this is what he says. I've been editing the listing thanks to you and one other child. But the edits are now done, and so are you. Okay, if I'm done, I should get my refund, right? I'm done. 
Well, you're not 100% wrong. I did have to update the listings, and even though I asked you not to be mad, you went dark and vindictive. So I dropped the shop work to do that. So now I hope no more use in my life. He denied my refund. Denied it. He says this, withdraw your online nasties. You do not say that you are just impatient. You are very misleading in your comments. Withdraw a negative review on a product you never got so you don't know. Or at least say you are an impatient person who does not understand the words, please don't be mad for the delay. So in other words, I'm supposed to go, oh man, I got mad. And he, and he, and he, and he said, please don't. And I got mad anyway, so it's all my fault. This is where the threats start. And so the claim was denied. Unless I withdraw a comment that I made on his YouTube channel. If I would take down a negative comment, he would give me the refund. If I did not take down the negative comment, he was not going to give me a refund. Refusing to refund unless he withdraws his negative reviews? Unbelievable. Chris says it best here. Now, to me, that's bullying. And there's nothing worse than a bully. And there's only a couple ways to handle a bully. Well, this is one of them. Well, I couldn't agree more, Chris. Looks like you and I have that in common. Chris's video continues on with example after example of extremely unprofessional and outright unethical behavior coming from the owner. He also mentioned some of the refund stipulations which seemed to me as nothing more than the clever catch-all to be able to indiscriminately refuse refunds or deny any responsibility of damage to buyer's guitars. In particular, the claim that not cleaning the file perfectly will damage the device or the frets. This thing is supposed to be a diamond grit file. It should be perfectly fine if it's clogged up. It won't work nearly as well while it's clogged, but that certainly shouldn't damage the device or your frets, and it would be impossible to tell if that happened unless this thing is just very poorly made, which very well could be the case. But I assume it's just a deliberate way for him to establish deniability for any damages. Just like Chris says here. But if there's no refund policy with this guy, because he can prove that you didn't, all he's got to say is, well, you clogged it up. You didn't do it right. It's all your fault. You're the bad person. And he's going to say at the very end of it, don't be mad. But I'm not giving you a refund. It's very difficult for me to not include more clips from this video because it is full of information, insight, and a ton of deeply entertaining tenacity. I can't recommend watching it enough. This guy has character and he's a riot to listen to. Moments like this just crack me up. But here's the thing about the maestro. And let's talk some maestro stuff, right? After this video, I went back to the forums and noticed another forum post about Fret Maestro from a guy with the username Lead Player. He posted saying how cool it looks and how he's going to buy one. He also added how he's bought several of their products before and loves them. Okay, fair enough. The comments were almost all critical, except for this Lead Player. Right as I started getting suspicious that this poster was the owner himself posing as a buyer, I saw this. That's interesting. So I opened up his profile. And isn't it interesting that the vast majority of his comments either directly reference products by the same company or make implications about how great specific materials are that this same company just so happens to use. And wouldn't you know it, the same exact username is also doing the same exact thing, days apart, on at least one other forum I can find. Not only that, but accounts with the same name of the company have made very similar posts to these in other places naming the same exact materials and using the same exact language and writing style. Suspicious? I'll let you decide. After seeing this, I returned to the last forum post and watched as the charade started to lift, and this mysterious lead player all but proved he is in fact the owner, making cringeworthy comments about himself like this and getting nastier and nastier with each comment. The same guy in the videos I've critiqued. The same guy that threatened Chris. Oh yeah, about that. Right after this, Chris told me that this guy later threatened him with legal action if he didn't rescind all negative comments. What a class act. The more this goes on, the worse and worse it gets. It's an appalling series of events that shows some of the most detestable behavior I've ever seen in my life. It feels like a Penguin Z Zero video in the making. 
Chris replied to one of my comments and asked if I wanted a screenshot of the threats. And of course, I said yes. But that response mysteriously disappeared. I don't think it's actually a mystery anymore why that might be. I even went to another one of Chris's videos to leave a comment, and it was falsely flagged and reported within minutes. This is the guy that told Chris that he works 18 hours a day to keep up on orders. I know what it's like to work 12 to 18 hours a day because I do it almost every day, and I certainly wouldn't have the time to monitor dozens of videos to falsely report comments. Of course, I didn't give up so easily. And here it is. This video was originally intended to simply be an analysis of this device and a neutral warning about some of the questionable claims being made about it, but it slowly turned into a story about abhorrent behavior being displayed by this one man. I'll let Chris say it. I don't trust his business. I don't trust him. I don't trust his practices. So I can't trust the product. With all of that said, on my scale of gimmick to godsend, Fret Maestro falls squarely into gimmick. Its capabilities are extremely limited, its cost is utterly excessive compared to what it can do, and the claims being made about it are nothing short of farcical. So please, if you're considering purchasing this tool, I ask that you at least take this video into consideration before doing so. I genuinely hope this was informative and helpful, and that I've successfully illustrated the tangled web of concerning issues surrounding this. Well, that's all. For now.